give folks a few minutes to get situated and then I will get us started. Hi everyone. Okay, let's get let's get rolling for today. So hi everyone, my name is Neil Simpkins and I am just now putting a link in the chat uh, to the intro that I'm reading from if you wanna follow along. Uh, I am a co-organizer with Chingy Chen uh, for Imagining Trans Futures. And I'm gonna start today with a little access orienting, a land acknowledgement and some introductions. Then we'll have Dr. Jules P Gil Peterson speak and we'll follow that with a Q&A session uh, moderated by me, Chingy, and our student assistant, Whitney Prawley. So uh, just some quick access orienting. Uh, let me start with a quick visual description for any listeners who are blind or have low vision. I'm a white man with brown hair and a beard and glasses, and I'm wearing a black shirt and a multicolored scarf. And I'm using one of my Zoom backgrounds, which in this case is some roses falling down. We are also recording the, the first part of this talk. Um, but not the Q&A. So I wanted to um, also start with a land acknowledgement. So we want to acknowledge the Coast Salish people of the land on which we stand and the land which touches the shared water of all the tribes and bands within the Squamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Um, when I give a land acknowledgement, especially in Seattle, I like to share two resources in particular that you can support. Uh, first, if you live in the Seattle area, you can pay symbolic rent to the Duwamish tribe to support their tribal services. And on the Seattle campus, you can also uh, support the Washeb Alta uh, Intellectual House, which is a longhouse style facility on the UW Seattle campus that provides a learning and gathering space for American Indian and Alaska Native students, faculty and staff. And they are currently fundraising to build a teaching and learning center. So those are two resources that you can uh, give back to in relation to the land acknowledgement. All right, so let me start with my intro to uh, Dr. Gil Peterson. We are so excited to bring Dr. Jules Gil Peterson to speak for Imagining Trans Futures. Dr. Gil Peterson is an associate professor of history at the Johns Hopkins University. Our goal for the Imagining Trans Futures cross-disciplinary research group, which is generously funded by the Simpson Center for the Humanities, is to bring scholars, artists, and leaders together in conversation around Imagining Trans Futures. Dr. Gil Peterson's work exemplifies this by giving us an understanding of how the historical constructs of transgender identity impact contemporary trans culture and trans cultures to come. Her work offers a trans of color critique to examine how medical models of trans identity center whiteness and exclude a wide variety of trans experiences of gender, especially those of BIPOC trans people. Her first book, Histories of the Transgender Child, won the Lambda Literary Award for Transgender Nonfiction, as well as the Children's Liter Literature Association Book Award. Histories of the Transgender Child uses a trans of color critique of medicine to unpack the contrasting histories of trans identity and the conceptually white trans child. Uncovering a surprising archive dating from the 1920s through the 1970s, histories of the transgender child shows how the concept of gender relies on the medicalization of children's presumed racial plasticity, challenging how we talk about today's medical model of transness. We are lucky to hear her speak from her new project today a slice from her new book, uh, book titled Gender Underground, A History of Trans D DIY. This project seeks to reframe the trans 20th century, not through institutional medicine, but the myriad do-it-yourself practices of trans people that forged parallel medical and social worlds for transition. So now I will stop talking and I will hand it over to Jules. Thank you so, so much, Neil, for a really generous, uh, lovely introduction. And hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I um, am really delighted to, to be a part of, of the Imagining Trans Futures uh, series and um, just, you know, wanted to acknowledge my excitement and energy around it. Um, and hopefully my contrarian take on futures, which will be <laughs> pulling us far into the past. Will will make some sense implicitly, but if not, it will also hopefully make some sense in conversation. Um, and you know, I I grew up in um, Vancouver, 
on the other side of, of, the, of the border. Um, and so even though it's just virtual, I always feel happy to be uh, at least virtually connected to the Pacific Northwest. So uh, yeah, say hi everyone to the region for me. I hope it's gloriously cloudy and, and drizzly um, as it should be. So I'm going to share um, my slides here. The talk that I'm giving today is titled Bean Street, the Trans Woman of Color's Evidence. And on the right of the screen here, you'll see um, an image that I'm not going to talk about in detail during the talk, but it's a, a photograph um, from the activist, the radical youth activist group, um, Vanguard, which in, in the 1960s in San Francisco is pretty, uh, pretty active pre-Stonewall uh, kind of gay liberation, well, pre-gay liberation, but you know, queer activist group. And, in, and you see them here holding brooms with some signs for a fall cleanup. So it's sort of a parodic street sweep, street cleanup kind of uh, demo that they were doing presumably in the Tenderloin District in San Francisco. But to me, this image is a bit of a synecdoche for some of the issues that I want to get at in my talk today. So we see a number of uh, cute, cute gay, presumably gay boys up in the front. Uh, and then there's one trans feminine figure kind of just stuck behind them staring off in a different direction. Um, so, you know, take that as sort of a meditation, if you will, for the talk today. So the street is ubiquitous enough as a refrain in the history of sexuality and in queer and trans studies that we might be forgiven for taking it for granted as merely descriptive. In a social movement and minority community driven narrative, the street is the place where queer and trans collectives come together to reckon with and oppose oppressive structures, to reclaim the right to be themselves and to suture their visibility to publicness. Think for only one example, of the compact, complex slide from the Stonewall Rebellion in the streets to today's corporate pride parades. Yet the street is also more specifically the place that harbors the most iconic and most ephemeral figures in that historical and political imaginary. Among them, the street queen, a poor trans feminine figure, often a femme of color, associated not just with militancy and visibility, but also stigma that which attends or attaches to sex work, police and extra legal violence and constant criminalization. The street queen is something like the background of so many imaginaries of queer social and particularly street life, though she is also often front and center as its privileged symbol, forming an exceptionally long lineage. From turn of the 20th century records created by vice squads or police uh, records to modernist writers and the post-1945 gay male literary canon to the thick descriptions of 1960s social science to documentary and art film and photography in the 1980s and 1990s and most recently to scholars in queer and trans studies this trans femme whose being is in some key way itself street, which is to say whose being doesn't incidentally transpire on the street, but whose style of life constitutes the reference point of the street for those who are not her. This archive is pretty voluminous and far exceeding what I could hope to present to you today. But my question is whether or not we've come any closer to knowing her, this street queen, a century on into this archive. Has her relegation to a historical, conceptual, and political landscape done anything more than flatten or hollow her out as symptomatic or iconic? What would it take to reinterpret the street queen as a potent source of evidence for trans women of color's historicity? These are the questions motivating my talk today which is sort of a follow-up to a very small line in the introduction to my book, Histories of the Transgender Child, where I speculated that the street people of the LGBT past are especially ephemeral historical subjects, largely unassimilable beyond their vague archival outline. And I suppose in the time since I've published that, I've, I've come to think I was rather premature to make that claim. So the questions that I raise here sit at the nexus of sort of two current projects that I'm working on. 
um, the longer monograph that Neil mentioned on the trans history of do-it-yourself transition, and then uh, a, a much shorter, more provocative book that polemically charges that trans womanhood has been up to this point unthinkable because undesirable, making the basic rudiments of a history of trans femininity a matter curiously missing, if not actually secreted from view by our obsessive investment in the hypervisibility of trans women of color. And so returning to the street comprises one entry in both of these projects. So I'm mixing a little bit here. And there'll be three parts to my talk. Uh, first, I'll cue us into the particular style of DIY trans life and survival, and I'm calling being street in the mid 20th century US city. Second, I'll situate the historicity of being street in the fault line of a critique I'm developing of the idealization of the trans woman of color in the dominant imaginary of LGBT history. And finally, I'll raise some thorny questions of method and interpretation that present themselves in trying to write, following Kaji Amin's formulation, a de-idealized account of street queens as historical subjects. Well, part one of the talk <laughs> is supposed to be titled Another Scum Manifesto, so hold that in your mind. To give a really provisional sense of the scale of this archive of the street queen, consider a few impossibly brief vignettes as evidence of the longevity, and I should say ubiquity of the trans woman as a fixture of the street. So this is real fast and rough and tumble, but it's just to give us a sense of scale. First, alongside historian George Chauncey's work on fairies and other trans feminine figures of the early 20th century, at New York City streetscape, we could linger on trans feminine writer Jenny June. In her second book length installment of life writing, The Female Impersonators, June recounts her apprenticeship in the public erotics of street fairy life in 1895. Having established herself at the Stuyvesant Square Park in Manhattan, she carried on one summer with men who treated her, quote, as if I were a full-fledged mademoiselle, end quote. This public pleasure was not without its risks, as June goes on to point out that the murder of trans femmes was already a well-known danger of the street in that era. She also importantly, I think, establishes that trans femininity was a known entity by the average interested New Yorker, writing that, quote, from my dress and mannerisms, any city bred youth would have already judged my sexual status, end quote. This moment, I think, perhaps inaugurates the motif of the trans feminine street queen as someone who makes meaning for those who are not her. If we fast forward a few decades and shift our attention uptown to the Harlem of the 1920s modernist renaissance, Langston Hughes' memoir, 1940 memoir, opens one of its chapters by recounting, albeit with evident disdain, a long running drag ball that attracted the racial and sexual tourists of the decade. His reminiscence also acknowledges the wider network catalyzed by Black ball culture in this era, calling upon a world of former queens stretching the cities of the Eastern seaboard. And you know, I'm putting some quotations from each of these texts up on the slides as I go, but I'm, I'm not gonna get into them in detail. They're just, you know, if, if they elaborate on what I'm saying. Third, we could find ample evidence of the centrality of street queens to queer social life in Buffalo, New York in the 1950s and 1960s, interestingly enough from a Butch perspective in Leslie Feinberg's Stone Butch Blues, which is quite careful to point out that the sex workers in gay community were quote, male and female. That's actually a phrase that recurs throughout the text. And the book of course features several trans women as close confidants and even one kind of culminating narrative lover of the protagonist Jess. In a particularly moving scene early on in the book, Peaches, a sex worker and trans woman, offers Jess her breast for comfort and offering the breast as the quintessential femme gesture of gendered care towards witches in that novel. And Peaches mentions to Jess that, you know, hers had grown from taking hormones. About a decade covering the period about a decade later, depictions of the sexual underground like John Reckie's prominently features street queens as important waypoints in, in gay culture. On the Hollywood Boulevard of the early 1970s, Reckie depicts trans women as the defiant quote, Amazons of the landscape 
making a black trans woman sex worker's affirmation of a white gay man's hustling the quintessential motif of authenticity as he settles in for a night of trade. And finally, on our brief tour, we could look at the visual culture that formed over this time period, bringing us closer to the academic foundations of queer and trans studies. The trans women of color associated with the street, like Crystal Labeja in the 1968 documentary, The Queen, of which we see a still on the left, or Venus Extravaganza in Jenny Livingston's 1990, Paris is Burning, of which we see a still on the right, have come to stand out and stand in for the rest of these films. And it's their difference really from the other queens and girls on screen that has become the, the subject of so much narrative struggle. But what I really want to underline, you know, in this archive would be twofold. First, the tendency to read the trans woman of color as emblematic or iconic of the street, which with each of these descriptions, you know, sort of reinforces. And second, the easy interpretive leap to therefore idealize her appearance, either as certifying a kind of historical authenticity, say for gay male subjects through a record of vulnerability or wayward life, or as a kind of beacon of resilience and resistance emanating from the streets most downtrodden. If the trans woman of color often appears on the street as the one whose position at the bottom of the social makes her the fiercest combatant in the struggles that define street life, let's say securing housing, negotiating sex work, staying safe from the police, not to mention gendered and racist violence, I want to pause and simply ask where this interpretive desire comes from, uh, whether it comes from us as onlookers or whether it comes from the archive. And I wanna do that by offering an instant of its diametrically opposed opposite. So in 1997, historian Susan Stryker interviewed performer and memoirist Alicia Brevard Crenshaw as part of an oral history project in San Francisco. Well, there's the title card I was looking for earlier. Okay. <laughs> Midway through the interview, and we see a photo of Crenshaw looking uh, rather debonair, rather gorgeous in mid-century. Um, midway through the interview, Stryker asked Crenshaw, who had moved to the city in the 1950s, to quote, paint me a picture of the Tenderloin neighborhood as experienced by a transgender person in 1959. Crenshaw had only lived in the Tenderloin for a few years, but she responded vividly that it was, quote, peopled, by gays certainly, but predominantly prostitutes, pimps, addicts, ex-cons. It was sort of the underbelly of society, end quote. But, quote, it was also an area where you were all outcasts. So you could look a little strange without fear. I felt safer actually, end quote. When Stryker asked her to elaborate, Crenshaw paused. She wondered if despite identifying as a transsexual and despite obtaining pretty rare access to gender confirmation surgery in 1962, whether something of her tenderloin days remained with her ineradicable. Quote, until you had said that just now, it had not dawned on me that everyone does not know this, she explained. Yes, she said to Stryker, I am to this day a street person. To be a street person was something so deep rooted to Crenshaw that despite not having lived that way for over 30 years, she had not realized or perhaps had forgotten that it was specialized knowledge formed of highly specific and underground experience. She continued describing to Stryker what it meant to her. Quote, I did have something that I developed on the street and that is when threatened, something takes over my body and words come out of my mouth and I have no idea who this person is. I become a survivalist. I'm a con. I can talk my way out of anything, end quote. To be street, in other words, as a modality or style of being was something akin to a survivalist's autonomia, a kind of learned but primal trans femme affect and behavior program that could kick into high gear when needed on a moment's notice and offered a sort of superpower that matched the heightened dangers of the street. And at first glance, the temptation might, read to, uh, might be to read this trans femme capacity as impressive historical evidence for how trans women in the 1950s and 1960s lived defiantly in conditions of severe marginalization and vulnerability. It might appear like direct testimony to unambiguous resilience in the face of interlocking barriers and vulnerabilities 
like police violence, sex work, poverty, addiction, homelessness, social exclusion, and urban segregation. But it's the involuntary quality of Crenshaw's narration that leads me to a second moment in her interview. Recall she's taken over or almost possessed, right? And here she casts the people of the Tenderloin in rather different terms. This is a long quote, so I'm putting it up on the screen. There was associated with all of this, whether it be drag or people partially in drag, whatever it was, but that real femme approach, it was very tawdry. A lot of, I don't think this is just me. I don't know whether the life sort of turned people into, it has nothing to do with perversion. It's just, well, it has nothing to do with decadence. It's, well, maybe decadence to a certain extent, but it just attracted low class, no breeding. And it's not even about prostitution. I don't know quite how to say what it was about. Just an ignorance and disregard for the self that I found very unattractive. That, well, these people are just scum, scum. So I removed, tried to remove myself from all that as much as possible. Of course, we were all vying for the same men, just got out of prison, whatever. It was really a scuzzy low time. I mean, darling, these places were just scuzzy, low, dirty dives. That's my Alicia Crenshaw voice, I guess. Um, the transcription of this moment with its long series of M dashes that accumulate some, to something verging on unintentional pose poetry is as arresting as it is disorienting. Scum. She called her fellow queer and trans femmes in the tenderloin scum. Whatever power and experiential knowledge gifted Crenshaw during her time on the street, the rest of the interview makes clear how she regarded her time amongst the poorest and most vulnerable and racialized trans women in San Francisco. So you want to talk about the tenderloin, she concluded to strike her. Well, for me, it was cheap and tawdry and ugly and something that I would have probably ended up taking an overdose of pills had I stayed there because I could not live like that. I simply couldn't. So I can't give you a lot of information about it, end quote. She may have remained street all these decades later, but for Crenshaw, this was a mark of stigma and failure, not resilience and resistance. There is no shortage of moments like this, particularly in the oral historical archive of the street from the mid-century. And if we are not to take such moments smugly, then they amount to something like a warning to the political desires we invest in the past and in our scholarship. You cannot count on the rosy version of trans resistance in the archive without some excessive idealization. So that takes me to part two, idealizing trans women of color. Every June, we're told a similar story about pride. Trans women of color led the fight for LGBT rights and we have to honor them because they still suffer the most. Like all tragedy genres, this narrative dramatizes the sacrifice of its heroes in a feel-good message. Things will somehow get better, despite the grisly truth of past and present, if we only turn our attention in the right direction. Alongside poorly contextualized statistics about violence, murder, and life expectancy, the idealization of trans women of color reassures that our noble victims left us with a roadmap to a better world than the one that treated them as disposable. If we zoom out for a moment, however, the story just doesn't add up. If black and brown trans women are the most oppressed in our communities today, just as they were, say, in 1969, yet they have also held the keys to revolution this whole time, why has nothing apparently materially changed? After 50 years of pride, why are its apparent figureheads still imperiled? What's missing from this frame? The real problem I contend is not that we haven't centered trans women of color enough, it's that this circular story of trans women of color's tragedy and triumph is itself a refusal to reckon with history. The problem emerges out of contemporary political desires for trans women of color to signify in a certain register, a desire that often includes historical imperatives, especially around figures like Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, those, though those are only really the most famous examples. And I'm alarmed at the dominant narratological poverty that circulates around marginalized trans life, particularly the figure of the trans woman of color. 
the trans woman of color appears generically as rhetoric or symbol invoked as the figure in whose name activism or intersectional scholarship is conducted, but the trans woman of color is just that, a figure. Centering her has not actually resulted in curiosity or sustained engagement with her everyday life, expertise, and activism. Had left trans political movements or even queer and trans studies done that, the primary issues of concern for them today would be prison abolition, police violence, and sex work not a kind of queer, and I should say often anti-transsexual or even non-binary politics of overcoming the gender binary, whatever that means, or at its narrowest, the highly conservative claim that trans women of color deserve to be saved from violence or death. As C. Riley Snorton and Jin Hara Tawarn have compellingly argued, this necropolitical logic governing the circulation of the figures of the black trans woman and the trans woman of color are vitalized by the material violence they invoke and record. Trans activism and queer and trans studies rely on the circulation of black trans and trans of color suffering and death to produce racialized knowledge of gender. In this economy, the trans woman of color is always the preface to knowledge production, but never its actual author, let alone content remaining thus somewhat empty. For only one prominent example, though I could give you others, I'll submit a foundational text of queer of color critique, Rod Ferguson's Aberrations in Black, which opens by invoking the figure of a black trans femme, or more precisely, someone that Ferguson calls, quote, a black drag queen prostitute, a passing figure in a scene from Marlon Riggs's 1989 film, Tongues Untied. And here you see two stills from that film where there's a black trans femme uh, sort of walking down uh, uh, an urban sidewalk and then later smoking a cigarette. If we linger on this figure's appearance, I think the question that emerges is quite simple. Why, in a film that is a deeply important statement about black gay men, does Ferguson instead turn to the one brief appearance of a trans femme? This woman appears midway through Tongues Untied with no context or speaking role. As she wanders a public space and smokes a cigarette, an Essex Hemphill poem is read as the voiceover and Nina Simone's song plays softly in the background. We learn nothing of who she is or what relationship she has to the rest of the men in the film. Ferguson minds her appearance for what it figures, asking of queer of color critique, quote, what mode of analysis would be appropriate for interpreting the, the drag queen prostitute as an image that allegorizes and symbolizes that social heterogeneity, end quote, of Black life? Those two words, allegorize and symbolize, are key. Aberration in Black's queer of color critique is not actually about what this Black trans femme knows or does with the situation of her life, but rather employs her as the precondition for a critique of racial capital and the positive establishment of an intersectional analytic for queer studies. Indeed, this Black trans femme disappears after the first few pages of the introduction in a way that often I have noticed when I teach the book leads readers to confuse her with the femme on the cover of the book. And here we see again another still from Tongues Untied of the, of the Black trans femme with her cigarette and on the right on the cover of Aberrations in Black with an entirely different Black trans femme on the cover. Now, I certainly don't mean to pick on Ferguson at all, whose work I not only admire, but I'm deeply indebted to. In fact, one of the larger questions I'm interested in here is the degree to which trans femininity's archive is indissociably that of the gay male imaginary. There is a way to read the 20th century figure of the trans femme street queen as central to the gay male imaginary of abjection and the stigma of effeminacy, something like the intensification of gay men's haunting by the sexological concept of inversion, where their homosexuality always contains the possibility of going, so to speak, all the way. And of course, some of us actually have that life trajectory. 
So part of what I mean to underline rather is simply the stasis of this allegorical symptomatic reading, which I do think Ferguson's scholarly arc from aberrations in black to the present illustrates well, but I could easily you know, pick any number of other folks. So nothing particular uh, against Rod here. But in his Kessler lecture at the CUNY Graduate Center last year, Ferguson begins with and invokes the trans women of color of street transvestite action revolutionaries or STAR as the proper intersectional ground for resisting fascism in the 20th century. In his words, a kind of lumpen proletariat that would guide us alongside the white male thinkers of the Frankfurt School. Again, I don't have time to give a full reading of the lecture here, but I'm interested in the scalability of the reading practice uh, that comes so easily in these moments and that I find quite troubling. So at one moment, Ferguson puts up this image, which we see here, which is a black and white still from Silvia Rivera's infamous 1973 speech delivered at New York Pride, um, uh, the, the footage of which was, was brought back to us in, uh, in digital form by Tourmaline, Ferguson suggests that, quote, Rivera's outcry at the Christopher Street Liberation Day implores us to consider how fascism recruits us into its regimes of acceptance, end quote. But the visual still of Rivera's speech, I think, fills in a rather large set of historical gaps from the specific concern of that speech in 1973, which you'll recall was the police, violence in jail and intramural violence of an ascendant trans exclusionary gay and lesbian liberation movement to make it signify the vanguard of an intersectional anti-fascist political program for everyone in the working classes. That is to say, I have my doubt about how this archival moment can ever certify the interpretation given except through intense idealization. Rivera's 1973 speech is hardly what I would characterize as material for idealization. As an angry indictment she had to physically fight her way on stage to deliver, I would at least read it as an emblem of trans negativity, of rage. Ferguson concludes his lecture by saying, quote, in their full appreciation, these histories encourage us to meet each other's needs and demand social change. There in the lumpen, household filled with queens who floated from room to room and with puppies that played and snuggled, we might find our model and inspiration, end quote. Model and inspiration, also puppies. Uh, again, nothing more than a few interview scraps and a picture of the Star House in New York City is actually cited as archival evidence that we should find in the intimate lives of the idealized trans women of color floating from room to room dreamily, as if this were not a dirt poor tenement where sex workers were attempting to find just enough harm reduction in their lives to survive, as if this is a kind of intersectional program for a proper anti-fascist justice in the 21st century. As a historian, I can only wonder how the archive is able to signify so much that is simply not there, except through the idealizing desire and correspondingly speculative reading practice of a politics derived from 2020, not 1973. And I think there's perhaps a fetish of the visible in play here, despite the definitive critiques of the trap of visibility made by a range of critical Black trans voices, especially Tourmaline, uh, along with Johanna Burton and Eric Stanley in Trap Door. That is to say, there is a presumption that indexing the mere presence of a Black trans woman or trans woman of color leaps into meaning or politics. The trans woman of color is so often like the Black femme from Tongues Untied, a performative subject whose presence is merely aesthetic or evocative rather than being a person or even a fully fledged historical actor beyond a symbolic register. So what are we to do methodologically then in this situation where the trans woman of color is only ever invoked as a figure caught between a dialectic of tragedy and idealization? What is the point of historical inquiry if it's not to retrieve evidence of trans women of color from the past and say, look, 
here they were, or here they are, as if that generates the same political meaning every single time. If we are to think critically about what trans women of color's history has to teach us, we will have to reckon with the serious friction attendant to that archive when it brushes up against our contemporary political desires. We'll have to think about how people like Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson and their community were finally street queens the very kinds that Alicia Crenshaw did not value, but we have tried to rescue from being stigmatized by unrealistically idealizing them to overcompensate. And so this takes me to the very last section of the talk. Part three, everybody knows, everybody knows. Several years ago, I found myself in San Francisco traipsing up the tenderloin one mostly sunny morning to a Vietnamese restaurant where I was meeting a trans woman of color who had lived in the neighborhood since the 1960s. I was nervous. This was my first oral history interview for my new book project, and I was also perilously early in my own transition. Tamara, my interviewee, was warm and generous, making sure I had an enormous amount of seafood soup before I turned on the recorder. After an embarrassing moment where I had to correct her presumption that I was a trans man and explain that I was actually a trans woman like her, I asked Tamara to tell me about what it was like to be a street queen and a sex worker in the late 1960s and 1970s. We were all together in the Tenderloin neighborhood, she explained, the queens and the gay kids, although still segregated in different bars and respective streets for different kinds of sex work, cis women in a different part of the city altogether, male sex workers in what was then called the meat market, and the trans women she lived with on their own corner. Tamara had taught herself drag and started living full time around 1968. Even though she worked in a government office during the day, she explained to me how lucrative and life-changing sex work could be. Quote, I would work and make money off regular people, but during the off time, like one or two in the morning, I started giving it away to the servicemen, spending the rest of the night with them in the hotel. Being a prostitute empowered me. It gave me financial stability. It was a good ego booster. It really built up my self-esteem. And again, I thought everybody prostituted. Everyone was telling me, quit your job, work full time as a prostitute. And they said, Tamara, you could get on this thing called social security. And in 1967, you would be getting $900 a month. A lot of the girls were getting their social security and working the streets. But you see, we were being murdered too. We were being murdered at an alarming rate. The next night after you found out somebody died, you still went to work, end quote. So in Tamara's recollection, being street was not a reactive set of compromises merely to survive in total deprivation as it was narrated by Crenshaw. It was more a collectively accumulated practice of a social world as girls on the street doing sex work together to leverage the the, their vulnerabilities into as much safety, financial security and well-being as possible. The street queens taught each other how to evade arrest under cross-dressing laws and how to deal with the police, even bribe or keep them compliant by befriending them. We had to save our lives, so we had to fight against the police, as she put it. Tomorrow's personal theory of being street has to do with the kind of young family child who would fight back against harassment from a young age rather than bear it. You couldn't fault the girls, as she put it. For one, they were thrown out of their families. They were the sissies that always had to fight. Something is better than nothing and working the streets was something, end quote. For a trans women of color who had been rejected and placed in danger from a young age, being street was a repertoire, well-developed already by the time they arrived in the tenderloin. Far from tragic figures then, they weren't exactly living ideal lives either by tomorrow's account. I shifted the interview at this point to how she and her girls got their hormones in the late 1960s. And before I could even finish the question, she answered, the streets. In an era where there was really only one very shady, dangerous doctor in town selling hormones with little regard for medical care, Tamara got involved in smuggling them into San Francisco, reselling them on the street and administering them to other trans women. So here is her narration of the process. We're lucky. Our next door neighbor is Mexico. You jump over, you cross the line, you know, you take the rap 
transit train from downtown San Diego all the way to the border. You hop on the bus, the JB bus, and it takes you over inside to town. It was a dollar. And then you walk into the pharmacy, you buy everything off the shelves. You load up your shit, haul it back, and bring it back and sell it on the street. They were out to make money, of course, that is the trans women. We also helped each other out. Everything was by word of mouth, by the street youth. So this was one of the most thrilling moments of my career as a researcher to date, accustomed as I had been for years to toiling in obscure institutional archives for a month on end without talking to anyone. All I had to do was ask, and I was going to find out exactly how the poor trans women of color sex workers of the Tenderloin had transitioned DIY in the 1960s. I already had the route mapped out. And this is uh, you know, a map here of Southern California and the you know, vague route if you were to drive from San Francisco to Tijuana right now. So what more can I ask for? If there was ever a rejoinder to Alicia Crenshaw's spiteful interview, I had surely found it but how wrong I was. I asked Tamara how she knew how to administer hormones, you know, track doses and so on. And I could tell right away that the question annoyed her. Everybody knows, she replied, everybody knows. We knew more than our doctors. But then she launched into a story about something else. And I inferred from her tone and body language that I was not supposed to push this line of questions any further. So I asked her a little bit later what she wanted people to know about street queens, those often invoked but rarely considered trans femmes of color from the mid-century, and her reply still really moves me. People would get together like on Sunday afternoons to go ahead and have dinners in their own homes and to talk about what happened during the week, just to relax and try to be normal. We would take off all our drags, our makeup, our eyelashes, and go to the zoo, and we would just walk around and talk to the animals. We did normal things that normal people do. Of course we were accosted for being sissies, but who cares? We got out of our element. Although I had felt frustrated that my primary research goal, which was to find out more about that underground economy of hormones, had stopped at its basic outline, as I've sat with this interview over the past few years, I've come to read this latter story about Tamara and her girls going to the zoo as an invitation to de-idealize my interpretation of her as a historical subject. Trained as we are in queer and trans studies to regard the word normal with suspicion, I would argue simply instead that what she's telling us in this moment is that the lives of poor trans women of color sex workers were neither tragic nor redemptive as we might be led to believe or desire either through contemporary politics or through a primarily gay male authored cultural imaginary of the street queen who is simultaneously that tragic figure of pure abjection but also the enigmatically free femme who has apparently said no to all social mores and norms. There is no model of radical intersectional politics to be extracted and scaled up out of the story of going to the zoo. But there is a claim to the personhood of these trans women of color made here. And that I would suggest is important as we learn the pitfalls of idealizing trans history and trans women of color. It also allows us to return to their important DIY efforts like the underground market and hormones, you know, sort of at face value in the archive. So to wrap up, the challenge as I see it is first to contextualize that the archive of the street queen, one of the best archives of trans women of color's historicity is itself constituted by a distortion that we should not adopt uncritically a desire for the street queen to signify and make meaning for those who are not her. Making her iconic, symbolic, and the locus of a political desire for the value of the past and the value of social marginalization, we have lost sight of our complicity with her continued allegorical obfuscation, her continued objectification for our politics and historical imaginary, dismissing all other modes of interpretation and respect. Yet the street queen is hardly subaltern or otherwise inaccessible. And as I sit with Tamara's redirection of my research question towards the mundane fact of the normal moments in her life with her girls, I hear an important directive. 
my proposal is that if we are to de-idealize the trans woman of color, which is to say, let her complexity overwhelm what we want her to be, or our desire to rescue her or rescue ourselves through her from stigma, then we can begin to ask historical questions of her being street. What is trans femininity if it is not a crisis of definition in womanhood, nor a mere subset of a generalized trans umbrella? What role have trans femmes, especially street queens, played in the social reproduction of queer life writ large, particularly for gay men, but also butches, trans men, and other historical groups, certainly cis men? And what does trans femininity look like, particularly when it's being a street, if we think of it as, racial, as a racialized and criminalized labor category, one figured primarily through proximity to sex work? From this point of departure, the one that I'm setting for myself in this work in progress, I sense not just a richer, more rigorous history of trans femininity, but also an opportunity to listen to Tamara. And finally, aim to do some justice to the trans women of color who populate my writing and my thinking. So thank you so much. Um, I'm looking forward to questions and talking with you all.